Hey guys, welcome back to a brand new video, and today we're going to be doing what I have been hoping to do for a while. This is my redistricting prediction, uh, and just a few disclaimers before I get started. First, I do want to give credit to uh, credit to God of Politics for making this video his video. I think he posted it back in February or March, and it was titled, Taking a Look at the 2022 Redistricting Process, and uh, he basically made a redistricting prediction. I, th I watched, I think it's a 20 minute video, it's decently long, but I watched all 20 minutes of it, and I highly encourage you all to go watch it, and he was a big reason why I decided to make this video. I also uh, want to thank Libnext2 on Twitter for uh, making a very cool Twitter thread for t teaching me how to make a national map on DRA. If anyone comments on this video asking me how to make a national map, I can hopefully uh, explain that. Again, I'm not great at it, I might actually have to make a video on doing it mostly because I'm not a great explainer, generally speaking, so I'd be pretty hopeless in the comments section. But if enough people recommend that, I guess I'll have to do that. Anyways, so uh, again, let's get started. But again, I, I do want to say that this is that these maps are very, very tedious in that it's very likely that I'm going to mess something up. There are going to be some states where I come pretty close to being accurate to so what happens. There are going to be other states where I'm going to, you know, look really stupid and that's okay this isn't gonna be my final prediction it's june i might wait make one you know kind of by the end of the summer um to see kind of where we're at and stuff is going to change we might see some unexpected gerrymanders we might see some unexpected fair maps and you know again i'm vehemently against gerrymandering i think it's terrible but uh they're going to be gerrymanders on both sides in this uh, video so first uh this is just a map of uh, who has control of drawing <clears throat> the congressional lines in these states so most of the swing states, like we talk, we take a look at Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota's, uh, Minnesota's another one, you know, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Pennsylvania, most of the Rust Belt has split control or an independent commission. So the three Rust Belt states that had, that were Republican gerrymanders in the past are going to be uh, either independent or split control, meaning we're probably going to see some fairer maps drawn in these states. Um, we also see, you know, some states where we have split control that isn't really split control, like, you know, we have Connecticut under split control, but that's only because you need a two-thirds state legislative majority to draw a map, and the Democrats do have the majority, they have, and they have the governorship as well, but it's, they're not, there's a, a couple of votes short of the two-thirds majority in the state legislature. Uh, New Jersey, they, I, I think we have a similar thing there, but, I, but they actually have, I think, a commission that leans Republican, although I'm not sure about that. Louisiana split, but this it's only because there's a very conservative Democrat governor, John Bell Edwards, who's pro probably not going to veto a map unless it's t terribly gerrymandered. Plus, the Republicans do have the ability to override a veto, so I don't really know why that's split. Kansas, there's a Democratic governor there, but the Republicans have literally said they're going to gerrymander the state, and that they're going to override any vetoes that Kelly does on a gerrymandered map. So uh, Kansas is going to be very gerrymandered, despite the fact that there's a Democratic governor. So, yeah, and then so, some of these independent commissions are going to be independent, others are not. I think Arizona is going to be pretty independent. We're going to see a pretty fair map in Arizona, whereas in California or Washington, these districts do lean Democratic or, you know, in a state like Idaho or Montana. And it doesn't really matter because these states only have two districts, but they're going to uh, lean Republican. So, yeah, so just to take a look at uh, Alaska and Hawaii, nothing going to change in Alaska. We see Alaska, the only one district there. It's it, it's going to be basically, you know, the same as the partisanship of the state. Um Hawaii, there are going to be two districts. I think we're going to basically see uh, in uh, Oahu-based district right here. Both these districts would be majority-minority. And then, so, yeah, these would be pretty safe. Blue, nothing changing too radically here. But now, now, when you go up to Washington, Washington is a state where they do have an independent commission, but that commission is not going to be as independent, I think, as the name would suggest. I mean, you have Democratic-appointed judges and people. And that commission, that would have, you know, a, a lot of reason to make a Democratic-leaning map, especially because... Uh, of how polarized the environment is. So this map, um, first of all, some of these partisanships are a little wacky. Like, I think these two Republican districts, this one's basically safe Republican. This one should be lean Republican, not really a toss-up. And this district is basically a toss-up up here. So they're probably going to draw out one Republican incumbent. I should actually pull that up right now. Yeah, so like I said, they're probably going to draw out Kath, uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers, and they're going to keep uh, Dan, uh, Dan Newhouse and Jamie Herrera Butler. Herrera Butler is a, more, a very moderate Republican who has appealed to the suburbs, and it makes sense because she comes from a suburban district, basically the suburbs of Portland as well as Vancouver, Washington. Um, and yeah, so 
Really, the only thing that's changing here is that we're going to see, um, in all likelihood, Kathy McMorris Rogers drawn out of her R plus 8 district, forced into a competitive Democratic leaning district where she probably loses re election if she chooses to run. So, in Washington, like I said, and I'll show you my spreadsheet at the end where we calculate all the numbers, that is a gain of one for the Democratic Party. Now, in Oregon, it's kind of the opposite, where despite the Democratic Party having total control of this, the Republicans literally have just walked out and said, we're not going to vote on a map and we're not going to let you pass a map unless it's semi-fair. And this map, again, is pretty ugly, but it does kind of represent what both parties need. Democrats essentially get four safe districts. I know this district over here doesn't look really perfect or that safe, but it's uh, with the growing Portland suburbs, this district would probably be D plus 10 in a couple of years. And at worst, the Democrats would win it by a point or two. And then the Republicans would probably carry both these districts. Uh, the only hope for Democrats flipping one of these districts is the more northern one, mostly because it, if they got really high turnout from the Portland suburbs and ex-suburbs uh, from Salem as well as Bend, they could potentially flip the district. But this is pretty much pretty a pretty safe uh, four, to, four to two map uh, that's probably going to be passed by the legislature. Now, my home state of California is a state where there is an independent commission drawing the lines, but... It's a very Democratic-leaning commission. I'm pretty sure everyone knows that this commission is full of liberal justices who are probably going to vote to make a gerrymandered map that doesn't look awful. So what we see right now is that, uh, according to my handy-dandy spreadsheet, I'm not, hopefully you don't read the other stuff there, but California right now has a 42 to 11 composition in favor of the Democrats. This map would give them a 46 to 6 edge. And, you know, the Republicans, they might be able to flip this seat over here. And again, these seats are just based on partisanship. There are going to be Democrats representing Republican district, Republican leaning districts, and there are going to be Republicans representing Democratic leaning districts. They're going to probably be, you know, young Kim might win re-election to her seat in suburban Los Angeles. It really is going to depend, and I even have some notes on my spreadsheet I'll show you at the end. But again, the map would roughly be 46 to 6 Democrat um, favored. Uh, you know, again, we could see D David Valadeo winning uh, a seat in the Central Valley down here, kind of in this region. Uh, if he chose to run any more competitive district, we could see, you know, a few suburban seats in Los Angeles flipping right because these seats are really, really close. Um, you know, we see maybe Young Kim, uh, those type of moderate Republicans winning seats here. Um, but yeah, and then there are also some, you know, majority Hispanic seats out here that are more rural that Democrats would be advantaged in, but they wouldn't necessarily be safe, especially if we saw a midterm with a low Democratic or low Hispanic turnout. That could really hurt uh, the Democratic incumbents in these seats. So going over to the state of Nevada, uh, Nevada is a state that the Democratic Party has total control of. It's pretty close. The legislatures are just barely Democratic, uh, which I, I guess makes sense for a state like Nevada that has a Democratic lean, but it's always going to be close. But uh, yeah, so Nevada is going to be a pretty gerrymandered state. This is the first day it's going to look terrible. Um, because the Democrats are going to basically just draw one really safe Republican district, which is going to be, uh, belong to Mark Amodi. And Amodi is basically just going to uh, accept this. I mean, the delegations are already three to one, but they're just going to solidify the Democratic seats here. So Amodi would win his district, uh, well, obviously very safe, basically just rural Nevada and some parts of southern Clark County, which are more Republican-leaning, so pretty safe district. And then the Democrats get two majority-minority seats in Las Vegas, making them out of VRA compliant. And then this ugly seat that kind of just goes at the uh, western end of Nevada and goes all the way from, from you know some parts of Las Vegas, runs up to the more uh, majority Hispanic parts of the state, you know, more rural Hispanic uh, precincts up, up here. Uh, maybe, I, I think there's actually Native American reservation up here that uh, gives the Democrats a couple thousand more voters. Then up to Carson City, there are some Democratic parts of Carson City, and most importantly, up to Reno. So this district will be around D plus six or seven. It could flip in a red wave, but it does help the Democrats out because currently they only have one safe seat, whereas here they have basically two and th another seat that's likely to go for them. So yeah, now going over to the state of Utah, we're going to see a pretty gerrymandered map. And actually, what I found funny was that the current congressional map in Utah, what you see is we have Utah uh, being a very gerrymandered to the Republican Party. Like, I'll just show you it right now. Um, this is the current map. And again, this is using uh, 2012 to 2018 composite data, which is going to be a little bit uh, skewed towards the Republican Party. As you can see, Ben McAdams' district right here would be labeled a safe Republican. It would have been, according to this uh, data set, I think, R plus, what, 30 or something. So again, very skewed. But we do see that the Republican Party just cracks Salt Lake City, it literally just in, into four districts. You can literally see that. They also just have Ogden packed into, or kind of just into this super Republican Northern District. So this is a, a map that's very gerrymandered uh, towards, the Republican par towards the Republican Party. And 
the population deviation over time has not aged very well, but it's still a map that is really bad uh, for a lot of reasons. And, you know, the commission's going to be Republican-leaning, and actually, if the commission draws a map that the Republican-controlled state legislature doesn't like, the, the state legislature can literally just overturn it. I don't know if you heard my, heard my snap. I snapped away from the microphone. There we go. I don't know. I haven't snapped in a while. I'm probably bad at snapping, but um, if if the state legislature does not like the map the commission draws, they can literally just nope, overturn it and draw their own map, which is going to be a Republican leaning. They might uh, just to a, the commission might just to please or to appease the legislature, just kind of draw a decent map. Oh shoot, this actually is not contiguous. There's a minor error right there, but you get what I'm trying to say here. Um, they, they might draw a map where there's like an, an R plus 10 district at worst for the GOP, but yeah. Now going up to, to Utah, I don't know why, but this map is not very pleasing to me. It just kind of looks ugly, but it basically just, uh, kind of packs, uh, Boise and then splits up the suburbs into two district packs Boise into this one district splits the suburbs into this, uh, between these two districts to, to ensure that even if Boise gets super blue, none of these districts get, get, get competitive. Obviously this being drawn by a Republican controlled commission. Over here, we're going to see two Republican-leaning seats, although this one based kind of in Missoula is going to be a little more competitive than this other one that's basically just the rural part of the state plus some bit, uh, plus Billings. So yeah, I'd expect the Republicans to hold both these seats until maybe 2026 or 2028, where this uh, Missoula-based district could essentially flip. Um, so yeah, that's my expectation for Montana, what they're going to do in redistricting. Uh, Wyoming, again, they only have one congressional district in Wyoming. Uh, the, the Dakota is nothing going to change there, although there is a minor glitch on South Dakota. The, there should be, I don't know whether one is there. Nebraska is, is going to be a state where the Republicans kind of have a tough decision. So they actually don't have, uh, the filibuster in Nebraska is, protect, is protected. So the Democrats can literally just filibuster a map that they don't like in the state legislature. But do not assume a Democratic gerrymander. Don't assume it's like that crazy map of those. So they're more, you have like a 65% Democratic district that just runs along all the way from Omaha to Scotts Bluff. But we're going to see a Republican-leaning compromise map where we see this second district get very, very competitive, get a little uh, – actually, I, I think this seat would actually have gone to Joe Biden by uh, basically the same amount as – maybe a little more actually than the current district. So it would be very hotly contested in the con uh, in congressional races. It would probably be won by Democrats at the presidential level. But with Don Bacon being a pretty strong and well-liked incumbent, I could see him holding on to this seat for a little bit. Then you also have this, you know, like R plus 19 or 20 district based in Lincoln, but – that wouldn't flip anytime soon. Kansas is a map that really looks uh, quite ugly, <clears throat> in my opinion, excuse me, mostly because it splits up uh, Kansas City area, and it also splits up, I believe, Topeka between uh, three districts, so looks pretty bad, but this is a map that would, generally speaking, stay Republican uh, for the time being, assuming the Democrats, you know, Sharice Davids could be a decent candidate for these districts, but assuming she didn't... Uh, she, she, these, these districts don't trend to the left too much. I'd assume that they would stay in Republican hands. Oklahoma, a five safe Republican districts while protecting incumbents. It does look kind of ugly, mostly because you have to protect incumbents when you draw these maps, or most of these maps at least. So, yeah, now Texas is another one that I just really, it's Texas is a state that's going to be gerrymandered. The Republicans have complete control of the state as they do in most deep south states. It's actually funny they have complete control of Georgia, but they don't have com com complete, complete control of Louisiana. Uh, so Texas, uh, I, there's only 12 Democratic districts, I think 10 of which would be majority minority, maybe even more than that. Actually, no. Yeah, I think 11 of which would be majority minority. There's only one which would be kind of in suburban Dallas, I think. That would be kind of northern Dallas. That would be majority uh, white. And then you'd also have, I think, two or three Republican districts. That would be majority minority. And a couple of districts where the mind, or I think you know that this district could be, uh, I think up to forty percent Hispanic potentially, um, depending on what you qualify, you know, voting age population, etc. Doesn't really matter though because this map would be VRA compliant as a result of basically every Democratic district just being a, a minority pack. We see El Paso uh, it being a very Democratic district. There we see f uh, five districts, or actually four or three districts, uh, kind of in the Rio Grande Valley where. Uh, Laredo based district, I believe that is, or, or McAllen. It's one of these southern cities. Uh, all three majority Hispanic. Actually, I think this one's like eighty percent Hispanic. Very Hispanic district there. Uh, we see some San Antonio and uh, Austin, th three Democrat districts out of there. I think three of which would be majority or minority. Th this district is kind of suburban uh, Austin. I think that could flip, uh, but would still be Republican leaning for the time come because Republicans in Texas generally do win these suburban seats for the most part. 
But then we see three districts in Houston that would be majority minority, as well as a district in Dallas that I think is actually majority black. There's also a, there's also a majority black district in Houston. So Texas, basically, as, as gerrymandered as it gets while being VRA compliant, so Texas is a pretty bad map for Democrats in Texas. Now, on the other, uh, I guess, other end of the coin, New Mexico doesn't look as terrible. Like, just look at these. Some of these districts are just atrocious in Texas, but New Mexico doesn't look as bad. But it would be a Democratic gerrymander. They'd win all these seats by in between 15 to 20 percent while protecting incumbents. So, yeah, and they also, as you can see, kind of split Albuquerque two ways. And then you have these Native American reservations up here being in this district. So, yeah, pretty, uh, pretty Democratic uh, gerrymandered map in New Mexico. Colorado is going to be a state where the Democrats actually have control of the commission there. Uh, but really, it's going to be a Democratic leaning map. It's, it's not going to be as bad of a gerrymander as we're going to see later in this video. But New Mexico is a state where the Democratic Party should or Colorado is a state where the Democratic Party should be gaining a seat, especially with getting a seat because of the census. So they're probably just going to draw out Lauren Boebert, her being the most polarizing Republican incumbent, being the least liked by the committee or by the commission uh, that would be drawing this map. So I'd expect uh, the Democrats to gain a seat in Colorado. And then in Arizona, um, I believe that the Democratic or that, that the Democratic Party would maintain that five to four majority they have. It would have been five to five if the Republicans get, had gained a seat there. Uh, but if but since that's not happening, we're probably just going to see uh, an incumbent protection map where we see uh, most of these districts being stored up for their incumbents. Uh, the only district that would be, be a little more competitive, I think, is Paul Gosar's district, which would actually be kind of uh, this actually is a pretty bad district, doesn't look terrible, but it would be kind of packing basically every Native American reservation in the state, with the exception of the Tono Reservation in the south, into one district, making it like a quarter Native American, but being very, very diluted because of the white vote. I'm not a fan of this district. I really hope it doesn't happen because it's one of the most Native American districts in, in the country currently, and it'd be kind of a gerrymander while not looking like a gerrymander. So if I had for Arizona map, this North Phoenix district could potentially flip in a couple of years, but for now it'd be Republican leaning, especially using 2018 Senate data, which is which I used for this map. Now going over to Minnesota, this is a state where the Democratic Party really could have uh, gained a seat, but uh, things kind of went basically the worst they could have possibly gone in, in the 2020 election. So uh, first of all, the Democratic Party lost control of the Minnesota state, of the Minnesota State Senate. They still have control of the state House of Representatives, and they still have control of the governor's mansion. But that does technically make for a split government, which is really not helpful for them if they want to gerrymander the state. They also, uh, the, the census, Minnesota barely held on to all eight of their congressional seats. I think it was like they were like 25 people above what they need to have for them to hold on to their seats. If like, you know, 25 or 26 less people had responded or something to the census. I'm not sure if I'm getting exactly the right number, but, you know, kind of in that uh, ballpark. Uh, Minnesota would, would have lost a congressional seat, and they probably would have lost a Republican congressional seat. But that being said, the, the Minnesota Democrats are going to have to deal with basically continuing a four to four map. Uh, the population has shifted into different areas, and while this map does still favor Democrats because there are two Republican districts that could potentially flip, uh, this is an, an Iron Range district where if the Democrats ran one more populist candidate, like maybe Colin Peterson could win this district or something, they could flip it. Uh, and then this district down here, if the um, if the Democrats ran someone like Tim Walls in the House again, uh, you know, to get good turnout from Rochester, he could definitely win this district. But you know, four to four map for now. Um, Iowa's really weird because you can't split counties, so the population deviation is always really high. Now, I actually was able to get it like barely under 0.75. I got it, like a 0.7 percent population deviation, which is still pretty bad, but it's legal. And so this district right here, uh, the opacity is a little messed up on, on this map. I don't know what I did. I just screwed up the opacity and I couldn't uh, get it to go back to where it should have been. But, you know, these three Republican districts are basically the same shade, you know, like the you know, 15 to 20 percent Republican districts or something. This Democratic district's pretty blue. This serves as a pack. You kind of go from Des Moines to Johnson County, which is just, again, you can't split counties. So it's you kind of stuck with what you got uh, to make a decent uh, Democratic a district that would serve as a Democratic pack. Then you have three more Republican leaning districts to the map, then all likely would, would stay three to one. Now, of course, Chuck Grassley did, he would have won this district in his 2016 Senate run, and he's probably going to win it in 2022 re election. But yeah, so Missouri is a state where the, where the Republicans have an opportunity to pick up a seat, but for whatever reason, people think they're not going to, which that makes no sense to me. So there are two Democrats right now. There's Cory Bush from 
St. Louis represents a majority minority district, and the Missouri Republican Party cannot draw her out legally. It would not be VRA compliant. Missouri needs at least one minority black district, and this is going to serve as a pack where you have a super safe uh, district for the Democratic Party in St. Louis, which is majority black. But there is another district that is essentially Democratic pack as well. You have the Democratic or the Kansas City area that's in Missouri, then kind of reaching over all the way across here to make a Democratic district that is represented by Emmanuel Cleaver. So Cleaver is a Democrat that's pretty moderate, and he actually has a good relationship with the with the Missouri State Legislature. For whatever reason, uh, there are people saying that that the Republicans are not going to draw him out just because they like the guy. And, you know, whether they like him, I. I mean, I'll assume that it's true. Like, he, he's not, you know, disliked. He's a pretty popular congressman. But just because they like him doesn't mean they're not going to draw him out when they can do it legally, when all they have to do is just uh, crack uh, his district. He could still run in this district and potentially win, depending on how competitive it is. But I did use a data set, 2012 to 2018 composite, that's going to, have to underestimate Democrat, uh, to underestimate Republicans. So in all likelihood, Missouri, only one Democratic seat. That's a Republican pickup in Missouri. Arkansas is really weird. The precincts in Arkansas are atrocious. So yes, I did notice, like for whatever reason, I couldn't fix this. But you, you do see a map where the the Republicans basically shore up French Hills district, uh, while making sure that everyone else, uh, the incumbents, stay in their district. So yeah, that is a uh, state that should be pretty uh, pretty safe for the Republicans. There's been talk about the Democrats getting gaining a seat in Louisiana, uh, a VRA seat in Louisiana. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that you know. Uh, people say, well, okay, what's going to happen is in Louisiana, John Bell Edwards is just going to be forced to draw a, or is, or the Republicans are going to be forced to draw a, um, a, uh, map that gives the Democrats an extra seat as a compromise so that John Bell Edwards signs the map and they don't really have to get nasty. But the Republicans, there are two independents who caucus with the Republicans who are basically safe Republican votes in the state Senate, um, that, and you know, technically, they don't have a they don't have a uh, have a have a have a veto override majority, but they still have a pretty like if the two independents vote with the Republican Party, which they're going to, they can just override John Bell Edwards' veto. So I think they're going to do it to appease uh, the the independents. I'm not sure how independent they are. I think they're just Republicans in sheep's clothing, but I think they're going to draw a more likely Republican district. You know, a, a go. From every other district being R plus 20 to maybe having an R plus 15 district that would just serve kind of as a placeholder for, uh, in, in, instead of the Republicans giving up another VRA seat kind of that would go along here. I don't know what happened here. I think I just forgot to assign a precinct. My bad. Again, these maps aren't going to be perfect, but they should uh, paint a good picture of what I think is going to happen. Going to Mississippi and Tennessee, you see that we have uh, uh, Tennessee cracking Nashville would be legal. E the Republicans would be forced to uh, draw one Democratic district in Memphis, but uh, they, you know, they're just going to keep that as as the majority minority district. But Nashville, this map cracks Nashville. It doesn't look great. It kind of cracks it four ways, and it looks pretty bad. But it's still legal, uh, and it's it does keep all the incumbents in their districts, so works out pretty well. Mississippi, you know, there was talk I saw on Twitter. Uh, someone said that the Republicans can draw a majority minority district. That. Uh, would be like R plus 0.5, and it would be, it, first of all, it, it would make two other seats likely Republican instead of safe. Second, the map isn't legal because it's 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 like 50.1% ma majority minority, but it's not, uh, but, in, but in terms of voting age population, it's actually not majority minority. It's like 49% minority. So that's actually not illegal. They, I mean, you can probably mess around with it a little bit, but it would be very hard for the Republicans to, to legally draw a four to, a four to zero map. Um, so Mississippi, they're just going to probably pack the Democrats into one district like they've been doing. Alabama is, is another one where the Democratic Party, there was talk of, of the, of the Republicans in Alabama drawing another seat for the Democrats. I don't know why they do that. They don't need to. And I get that the black population in Alabama might be, might be growing in some regions, but they're not going to need to draw another majority black district for the foreseeable future. So you keep, uh, Terry Sewell and her district being, this district will be 51% black. So it is VRA compliant. And it gets a little bit more competitive. It would be around D plus 18 when her, and I think she won her district, but like it, it gets a little more competitive. So maybe in a huge red wave, they could flip the district if black turnout is especially low. Florida, I'll be up front. I, I did mess up the Tampa Bay area. The, the Tampa area, uh, there are uh, some precincts that the, the, anyone who's tried to redistrict Florida can, um, will agree with me that the Tampa precincts are terrible. I try to split as many precincts as I could, but 
essentially these two districts are going to be a, a very ugly. And obviously, I if I was actually submitting this map to be reviewed by the Florida State Legislature, which I'm not going to for obvious reasons because I can't, um, I would still have to uh, make this uh, map a lot cleaner. But yeah, Tampa Bay looks bad. Then there are these two unassigned precincts, but I think they have no people if they're, yeah, th th these precincts would have no people. So yeah, other than that, I think this Florida map is a pretty good Republican gerrymander. Uh, this district up here is majority minority. It uh, basically just packs Tallahassee and the more uh, in the uh, black parts of Jacksonville into one district. Um, you have the Pensacola based district here that Matt Gates represents. You have just this North Florida district that's safe red. You do have to, uh, I, I think um, you can legally pack Gainesville uh, right here into uh, th this district with, with it being safe Republican. You can also draw a St. Augustine based district that's basically our safe R. It's this, like R plus 16 or 17. We can, you know, if you want, I can take a deeper dive into these maps that show you the exact margins and data sets. We can play around with that. But yeah, so Florida, um, and then, and then you're, you, you can also legally draw a map where the Republican Party uh, gains a seat in the Orlando area the, by basically drawing out Stephanie Murphy uh, and giving them, uh, M Murphy might choose to run this seat and just make it safety, and then you have a majority minority seat in Orlando. Uh, then you also have uh, this seat in St. Petersburg, which I believe is, or in, in, in Tampa Bay, excuse me, which I believe is, is majority black uh, or majority minority, I'm not sure, but I know this, this was a VRA seat that they have to draw, they cannot, uh, the Republican Party would have a very hard time legally drawing out the Democrats are running from having any representation in the Tampa Bay area, but they do uh, get to make Charlie Chris district right here more Republican. Uh, their current map it's like a toss up district. This map would be like R plus five or something. So Chris maybe maybe he could win an R plus five district, but it would be a lot closer. He won re-election by six points last November. He'd probably be in a very tough fight for re-election if you put Wispet in this district. Uh, so Miami Dade, I, I think that this is actually overestimating the Democratic Party because you can't use the 2020 data uh, president data set. If if you did, you might see the Republic, the Democrats winning uh, an extra seat up here uh, in Tampa Bay because Biden did better in Pinellas County. Um, but this seat would probably be safe Republican. This seat would probably be a toss up. This seat would probably be lean Republican. So yeah, but for the sake of argument, I did calculate this. So you do. So I did technically calculate that that, that this is a 10 D. 18 R map, but it's basically an eight or nine D map in it. And again, I think you have two or three or four majority minority. I think three, based on what I'm looking at, three majority minority uh, districts that would be Republican leading in this data set. Georgia is a really weird one. I, I, I'm really iffy on Georgia, and I'm and if and if anyone comments like your Georgia map is terrible, I agree. I could not figure out what to do for Georgia. I tried to gerrymander it for the Republicans while making VRA compliant, and you really can't. It's very hard to eliminate this uh, kind of. Western majority minority district, the, the Republicans have to keep that. They've also kind of got to keep at least three or four, or basically at least three districts in Atlanta that would be majority black. Uh, and, and I tried to do that, and I tried to make the, the suburbs as, as red as possible, but I ended up with this really weird district out here that because I, I forgot to fill in some areas, and I forgot how blue they were. So I did draw a 7 to 7 map. I, I think that the Georgia uh, that Georgia might end up looking like this, mostly because they're going to have to, because eventually these suburban districts here are going to become safe uh democrat because because the suburban swing and then this district out here that's a uh, toss-up leader kind of only leading republican is, is going to get safer because this area is trending to the right we also have to remember that this district is trending to the uh, right overall so this district could be competitive by the end of the decade so i guess this this kind of serves as an ugly looking map right now but it does pack the democrats into seven districts for the um the rest of the decade so i guess it's a safer play for the gop especially if they're confident about what they're doing in other states South Carolina is pretty ugly, I'll admit that, but it's kind of, uh, it's kind of what you have to do because you have to uh, keep the incumbents in their districts pretty much, and Clyburn would still be representing a majority black district right here. And you have to shore up Nancy Mace's seat over here because Mace uh, lost her seat, or uh, Joe, Joe, Joe Cunningham represented this seat for a bit in Congress for two years in, in that Democratic way where he won his seat basically based on Charleston. I had to shore it up a little bit for Nancy Mace. Um, yeah. Tennessee, I, I talked about Tennessee. Um, North Carolina is another one where you, you're you basically going to see the same map, but there, but North Carolina is gaining a seat, and, are, and it's probably going to go to the Republicans. Roy Cooper does not have veto power uh, in the in this uh, state, so he doesn't get to really uh, have a say in the, in the redistricting process, as we see in all these, uh, in all these Republican states. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but... North Carolina, you see a lot of the seats say the same, so it's a five to nine Republican map. Kentucky, I talked about this earlier. I think that Kentucky, the Republicans are going to draw out 
um, uh, Jim, I'm, 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 Jim Yarmouth, I almost forgot his name. Uh, they can do that legally while keeping incumbents in their districts. It, it's, it's a pretty ugly map. It's, it's, it's quite an intense gerrymander, but you can still do it legally. Um, so Kentucky probably would be staying. Uh, the, the, the Republicans probably gain a seat in Kentucky. West Virginia is losing a seat. So West Virginia, the Republican Party just basically just gets to, gets to draw two safe Republican seats. You cannot draw a non-safe Republican seat in West Virginia using the data set the, that, that, that are available on DRA. Um, in Illinois, uh, the, the, the Democrats literally said they're going to gerrymander the state. I, you know, it's gerrymandering is unfortunate, uh, of course, but they basically just said, you know, we're going to gerrymander. We don't care. And this is the map they're going to drop that was proposed. Um, you have kind of a downstate district that just uh, packs Springfield in, in those other Democratic areas into one district that would be like D plus 10 or 11. You have these uh, Collar County districts that would be very, very Republican. Um, or that'd be very, very democratic, uh, you know, relative to most suburbs, you know, the safe Chicago districts, making it uh, VRA compliant. You also would see um, this competitive district based kind of uh, in the out- outer area. I, I'm forgetting the name of the cities. I know I sound, maybe it's not like an idiot right now. Hopefully I don't, but uh, that's basically what we have to do here. It, you, you can't legally shore up this district with uh, the VRA. I, I think it's possible to maybe do it, but but I actually did use God of Politics as map for the state of Illinois. So you're probably going to have to, uh, the Democrats are probably going to draw a 14 to 3 map in Illinois, which would still be a net gain of, I believe, two seats. Uh, in Wisconsin, uh, you know, Wisconsin's weird because the political, because the geography for Democrats is just atrocious. They're, they're all packed into Madison and uh, Milwaukee, and you cannot draw a 4 to 3 Democratic map, which would probably be the most fair map. Without it looking terrible, so you're just so you're just going to see an incumbent protection app where Wisconsin, uh, uh, you, you just see you know, um, Mark Pokin being uh short, his district being shored up, Gwen Moore her district being shored up, and then the competitive district of the state would probably be Ron Kine's district. Kine actually represents a Trump district, so uh, he, even though this district looks competitive, he'd probably still win it by ten. Uh, you know, he he ran like I think eight points ahead of Joe Biden. If this is like a R, it's, it's like a D plus four, three or four district, he'd probably win it by double digits. To be completely honest, he's quite a popular incumbent. So yeah, then you have these the four districts that are pretty safe for the GOP, um, and uh, then you have um, this uh, district right here. Uh, that's basically just the suburbs or the some parts of the Wild counties as well as uh, Kenosha. Which would make it competitive, but it's trying to do the right overall. Uh, so yeah. Uh, now Indiana is is interesting because the Republicans, I think they actually can potentially. I'm actually not sure about Indiana, but I th- obviously they have full control of, of the state. But I think that they can potentially legally draw out uh, the uh, Gary base district uh, for the Democratic Party, but I'm not sure. For the for the time being, I'm I'm just gonna assume uh, that they're gonna keep the map the way it is, although they could gain a district here. I'm not sure about this. Uh, the, the, the Indianapolis gerrymander looks atrocious because they're trying to keep incumbents in their districts, so they can probably do it cleaner than I did. Ohio is really weird because I think you can actually draw a thirteen to two map, but it wouldn't be VRA compliant. Although it's it, it's it's kind of weird because Ohio has its own laws where you can't split cities and you can't do that with Cleveland. Uh, and yeah, so basically, so Cleveland is basically big enough to make up one district. I think it's like five thousand people smaller, so you just basically have to pack Cleveland into one district, which again is ohio law but cleveland wouldn't but the Cle- but cleveland itself is not majority black so it's really weird i'm, I'm not gonna even pretend like i understand ohio laws plus their precincts are awful like i had to make you know <laughs> really weird looking shapes in columbus so yeah and i had to also pack the democrats into one district in cincinnati it may look a little competitive now but th- this area is trending blue really quickly so I think that Cincinnati, this, this is just going to serve as a pack, uh, and then a suburban pack here. So you basically are going to end up with four safe Democratic districts, and then these more competitive Republican-leaning districts would basically be, uh, th- they'd become safer for the, for the GOP uh, because they would, because uh, these more king-class districts are basically trying to the right. Uh, Tim Ryan would probably lose re-election in his district. Um, so Ohio, nothing changes here, although I think the, the incumbents get a lot safer safer um and in virginia i think that you have to draw two pl- uh, plurality black districts basically in nova which i was able to do uh and then you also have to uh, attempt to follow county lines but 
I didn't really do that too much uh, here uh, in this map. So I'm not sure if it's legal or not. My guess is that it is and that the Democrats will probably just draw a 7-4 map that looks okay. But that's what I think is going to happen in Virginia. Maryland, the Democrats are going to gerrymander Maryland. Um, Larry Hogan doesn't really – he can't really do anything because the Democrats have a uh, – have full – power in the state legislature they can just do whatever they want here despite hogan being a uh a republican governor they can do basically whatever they want because they have a uh, filibuster proof majority and because they can just override his veto so expect an 8 to 0 map that is vra compliant for maryland pennsylvania is weird so pennsylvania i was originally to think that the republicans were going to gerrymander it but they're going to have an independent commission and with a democratic governor and a democratic supreme court that should be pretty good for the democrats Plus, the person chairing the commission is a registered Democrat and is a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, I believe, who is an outspoken Democratic act, uh, activist. So he's probably going to be leading a commission that's going to be a little Democratic-leaning. It, it's not going to be really a gerrymander. I just think that the Democrats are going to potentially net a seat out of Pennsylvania for this reason. Um, although, again, th these districts up here are going to be pretty close. Matt Cartwright probably wins his district because he is in R plus five district. And you know, with this, you can just make like a D plus one or two district and he can just win there by seven because he runs, you know, generally five points ahead of the partisanship of his district. Susan Wilde might lose reelection though. Uh, and and then by the way, this Lee and D district basically in just Bucks County, it look, it, the partisanship is, is like D plus three or four, but Brian Fitzpatrick would definitely win re-election years. This is just a Republican district. I'll be like, I'll be straight up. This is just Fitzpatrick. You know, he ran like what, 12 points ahead of Trump in, in, in his district. He's just a really popular moderate in the suburbs who's just going to win his district. So the map's technically 10 to seven, but it's basically not eight to nine and potentially, or basically nine to eight in favor of the Democrats. And if, uh, and if, uh, I think Susan Wilde in this district uh, loses her bid, which I think she could easily do. I'm not sure how strong of an incumbent she is. I think that it, it could easily be a 9 to 8 GOP map. So not really too gerrymandered, although Connor Lamb does get shored up here. So the Republicans are going to stop targeting him uh, for uh, the time being. New York, I showed this uh, in my Democratic or gerrymander, in my uh, f fair map section of the New York video. This is, this is not a fair map. This is a Democratic gerrymander. But it's VRA compliant, and I think that they're going to draw it, and it doesn't look terrible. So it's probably going to happen there. New Jersey, actually, the, the Republicans have an underrated chance of gaining seats in New Jersey because the commission is actually – it's it's a pretty Republican-leaning commission when you look at it because I think that the people on the commission were appointed by go, uh, by Governor Chris Christie, who was a, a very Republican, a conservative governor of the state. Um, so New Jersey really is – an underrated pickup opportunity for Republicans. Although I do think that these that this tilt Republican district that Andy Kim runs in, he probably win re-election there. Just to note that because he did because he did win re-election in Trump district as a Democrat, so he'd probably win. So the map is technically seven to five, but it's basically eight to four in favor for the Democrats. Although that would still be a net gain of two for the GOP. Connecticut, I think the GOP is going to gain a seat here because the Democrats are close to having the two thirds majority needed to just pass the map on their own. Uh, they're like I think a seat or two away, but they're not gonna be able to uh, because they uh, because they're they're gonna be a seat or two away, and the Republicans are gonna be pretty united in, against a, uh, a five to zero map for for the Democrats or sorry a six to zero map I believe no no that's a five to zero map my bad um and if the Democrat and if the state legislature does not agree on a map it just goes to a commission and the commission's probably gonna draw a map similar to this but I think the Democrats are just gonna compromise by drawing a toss up district that has their site Republican lean. But I think that Joe Biden would have won this district in 2020 anyways. So, you know, probably it probably a kind of just the Democrats just baiting the Republicans into voting for this map. That makes one district like a little bit more competitive. But I think the Democrats still probably hold on to the seat. But, you know, uh, I'm not really sure what to expect. This obviously for a competitive district in Rhode Island, uh, it's, they were going to lose a seat. But I think that, you know, uh, just barely enough. Rhode Islanders filled out the census for them to uh, to hold that seat. Massachusetts obviously staying nine to zero for the Democrats. Vermont only one seat. New Hampshire, um, this district up here in New Hampshire, I think is is going to be really really close. Um, it's trending Republican, I believe, because it's because of how rural it is. But there's going to be a lot of you know white liberal voters who are going to keep the district uh, competitive for the time being. Uh, the Republicans do have complete control of this because they have the majority in the state legislature and they have Governor Chris Sununu, but expect a, a uh, map where the Republicans basically pack the Democrats into one safe district where I think Chris Pappas would, would, would win, and then 
uh, and Custer would have to run in that toss-up district that I think the Republicans could win. Usually, I don't think you can actually legally draw, because uh, we can't split cities in New Hampshire, you can't legally draw a 2 to nothing map um, using 2020 precedent data, which is what I used for this uh, state. So, yeah, uh, and then Maine, of course, we have Jared Golden. I, I think he, him being from this region down here, he'd be forced to run in this uh, toss-up district, which, again, it... It would, it would be close. He'd probably lose re-election or by a point or so, but he could easily win and heat the delegation to nothing. And then I think that I skipped over Michigan for whatever reason. I didn't do it. I actually didn't make this up. Someone on Twitter gave this to me and told me to use it for this video, but I think that Michigan is, is going to be a state where we're just going to see an incumbent protection map like we're going to see in a lot of these Rust Belt states like Wisconsin as well. So with that being said, this is going to be a really long video, and I apologize uh, for kind of uh, rushing uh, in, in this video. And I'm going to show you the spreadsheet as well for the final tally. But uh, th this is my redistricting prediction, obviously ex excluding Alaska and Hawaii. Georgia is really the iffiest thing. But overall, I originally expected the Democrats to lose thousands because of gerrymandering. It's going to be better th for them than I thought. And this is with me being pretty aggressive in a lot of states. So I think that the Democrats are still have like a decent chance of maintaining the House. People say it's a done deal. I think it's basically 45 to 55 in favor of the GOP. Uh, so again, some of these, like expect these toss up seats to, to lean Republican because of the midterm energy factor. But, you know, really, when you take a look at the final tally, the Democrats actually have the lead here. Uh, th there are more, I think, Biden district or Republicans than there are Trump district Democrats. So you'd probably see this tally being basically even. So we don't really see too much change here. Um, I think God of politics, um, uh, gave the GOP a, literally a one seat advantage in the house. I give the Democrats a 17 seat advantage. And I know it sounds like a lot, but it's really not, especially because, you know, like you flip a seat, that's basically a net gain of two when you think about it on the math. But yeah. Uh, so this is pretty much it. Um, if you want to uh, take a look to pause the video and see what I have here, um, I, I do have some notes here. Obviously, Jerry Golden, Maine could win that uh, Republican lean district. Andy Kim, New Jersey. John Catco, I forgot to mention John Catco in New York is another one. Who worries me, uh, this district up here, I think he'd be running in this district. He'd probably just win it, to be completely honest with you. So that's another one. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick in Pennsylvania, and I talked about that. So, yeah, uh, and I think that'll be it for this video, guys. So if you enjoyed, please do leave a like. Comment down below what you think. If there are any maps you disagree with, let me know in the comments down below. Again, this wasn't perfect. There were some precincts, especially in the Tampa Bay area, that I really did mess up. But it, but if you enjoyed, please do leave a like. Subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you all in the next video.